get to it. Uh, I am thrilled to roll out the latest episode of the Quantum Live seminar series dedicated to the research and academic quantum communities. The seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern time right now and will be hosted on the Kiskin YouTube channel. So you can always go back and watch these afterwards as well. And uh, I'm delighted to see so many of you tuned in from all over already. I'm your host, Slot Kominev from IBM Quantum Research. And today I have the pleasure and privilege of hosting Professor Mohamed Mir Husseini from uh, the Caltech Department of Electrical Engineering. Hello, Mohamed. How are you today? Hi, Zalatko. Very good. How are you? Uh, great. And uh, where are you tuning in today from, Mohamed? Well, I'm joining from Pasadena in California. All right. Well, sounds like a good place to be today. Um, and, uh, I think before we pull up your slides, Mohammed, let me give a little bit of background. Uh, Mohammed joined uh, the Department of Electrical Engineering at Caltech as an assistant professor uh, in September 2020, uh, I guess just now. Uh, previously, he was a KNI Prize postdoctoral scholar at Caltech with uh, Oscar Painter, where he worked on entangling distant transmon qubits with microwave waveguides, developed integrated devices uh, for microwave to optical quantum transduction. Mohammed did his PhD at the uh, University of Rochester with Bob Boyd, and his thesis work was on high capacity quantum communication with structured photons, for which he received the Carl E. Anderson Division of Laser Science Dissertation Award. He's also uh, received the Emma Wolf Award and so on. Beyond physics, Mohammed enjoys reading a bit about history and politics when he has the time nowadays, and his hobbies include amateur astronomy and hiking. Um, so I think we'll pull up your slides, Mohammed, and uh, I'll remind everyone this is an interactive talk, so uh, feel free to ask questions during the talk. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. And thank you for coming today, for accepting the invitation. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for the introduction and for inviting me to be here. Uh, it's very exciting. So, as you mentioned, I'm going to talk about quantum transduction and present some of our latest results uh, working on this project. Before getting into the talk, I, I have this picture here, which shows, you know, one of our devices undergoing some preliminary room temperature measurements. But at this very high level, you can see we have something that have you know, RF cables are sticking out on one end and you have the fiber on the other end shining light on it. So I guess, you know, at this high level, it gives you an indication of what I'm going to talk about. Before getting to the result, let me talk a little bit about the team. Uh, quantum transduction has been a topic of research in Oscar Painter's group in probably the past 10 years, starting from a theory proposal back in 2011. And since then there has been, you know, multiple, uh, versions of this experiment uh, working on different approaches to realize this. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is on the most uh, recent re reincarnation of this project where uh, Mahmoud Kalai, Al Sepahigil, and myself were the three postdocs working on this project. Uh, you know, beyond the immediate results that I'm going to talk about, uh, we actually relied on a lot of previous work on uh, doing quantum optical mechanics with, with silicon devices and their uh, Jared Wren and Greg McCabe were the two students uh, working on these previous results, which really benefited these uh, latest experiments. <clears throat> and just a little bit more about myself, as the intro mentioned, I'm just starting uh, at the Department of Electrical Engineering. Uh, our group interest is, is in superconductors and quantum transducers. I hope you don't mind this little bit of a shameless plug, but uh, we have openings at many levels. So if you know interested people, please spread the word. With, with that, I'll, I'll get to the beginning of my talk. Uh, I mean, probably the audience here knows everything about superconducting qubits, so there's not much need for an introduction. But I would like to uh, talk about some of the interesting properties that makes these systems uh, exciting, and also some of their limitations that really motivate us to work on quantum transduction. So perhaps the most interesting property of qubits is the absence of DC resistance, which really provides a low dissipation environment where we can uh, store quantum information in a coherent fashion for you know, hundreds of microseconds and up to milliseconds, depending on the details of, of, of the devices you are working with. Uh, in addition to that, we have the really strong nonlinear response from the Josephson effect uh, which allows us to make an effectively two-level system and use it as a qubit. 
And more interestingly, these qubits can possess large dipoles, which give us strong interactions between them, which is something we need to realize multi-qubit gates. And finally, we have these you know, artificial uh, manufactured nature of these devices, which uh, allows us to make many qubits on the same chip and potentially have a scalable way of uh, making a quantum processor with many qubits, which has created you know, the recent uh, interest in making a quantum computer based on this technology. But despite this nice, I mean, looking at these nice properties, you may think that we have everything we might need in a superconducting circuit. But thinking about the main ingredients of what we might generally need for processing quantum information, we can, we can identify a few different tasks. And even though superconducting qubits are very good for storing a quantum information and modifying it, when we think about uh, the need for passing information among different parts of our system, they tend to be slightly weaker. Uh, when thinking about information transfer, we naturally tend to think about photons, photons as the carriers of information, and uh, qubits can interact with photons just like an atom interacts with optical photons. But when they interact with electromagnetic fields because of their transition frequency, they actually emit microwave photons. And you can use microwave photons to send information over a line, over some distance, which has been demonstrated before, but it creates a few limitations. Um, so first of all, if you have a microwave photon, you have to keep it in a cold environment, like a dilution refrigerator, uh, to avoid dissipation and loss. And, and even if you do that, you can only propagate it for a few meters, which, which is really limiting when you think about uh, long distance information transfer. And you can, we can, Contrast this to the case of optical photons, where we can regularly send them over optical fibers for tens of kilometers. And uh, you know, this this comparison really is, is a big part of motivations for working on quantum transducers. So the idea, the main idea behind a quantum transducer is that if we have a way of passing on information from the microwave domain to the optical domain in a faithful way, then we can really combine all these amazing properties of superconducting qubits with the long-range information transfer. Uh, capability of optical photons and then that combination would let us think about things like distributing entanglement on the global scales with quantum repeaters or we can think about uh, making room temperature links or connecting multiple dilution refrigerators to make a larger distributed quantum computer or even use optical fibers to connect multiple parts of a larger quantum computer inside a large dilution refrigerator so i hope this provide some context for uh, the topic of the talk. Now, before, uh, before going to the rest of it, I'm gonna talk about the physical uh, requirements that we need from a transducer. And by the way, feel free to ask questions along the way. Yes, yes, thank you. So thinking about, <laughs> sure. So thinking about what we need to realize a quantum transducer, uh, we actually ultimately care about uh, passing on information between the microwave domain and the optical domain. Uh, without losing fidelity. And if we think about what that translates to, we, it comes down to having access to a process that is particle number preserving. It has uh, no additional noise. And we want it to also preserve phases in, you know, in superposition states. And this combination is actually pretty simple. You can get it from a linear unitary transformation. But even though this is conceptually very simple, it's actually pretty hard to realize this in practice. And that's mostly because we are trying to gap a very, to, to bridge a very large uh, frequency gap from you know, a few gigahertz all the way to 200 terahertz. And that forces us to deal with very different physical systems, which is inherently uh, hard to connect them together. Uh, thinking about physical processes that make quantum transduction possible, we, we can think about, you know, first, the first thing we notice when we think about physical processes is that we, we need to change the frequency. And changing frequency often requires a nonlinear electromagnetic response, which we don't have in vacuum. So we would have to rely on some material response uh, to get it. And there's actually basically two broad categories of things that you can do to realize this. The first approach is to use bulk nonlinearities. So, for example, you can use the Pockels effect, where you can apply a voltage to a nonlinear crystal, and that would cause the refractive index of the crystal to change. So, that would 
give you a way of converting the voltage in a microwave resonator uh, to an optical sideband of the laser beam. And you can use that to convert microwave photons to optical photons. Or instead, you can think about making a uh, system with multiple parts where you have an intermediate degree of freedom with simultaneous coupling to the microwave and optical parts. And there you can think of this information transfer as a sequential process where you prepare your state in the microwave domain, pass it to this intermediary, and then from there you move it to optics. And there's a few different systems that have these properties. One of the prime candidates uh, is, is the mechanical oscillators. Mechanical oscillators do interact with microwave fields via piezoelectric, piezoelectricity, and they interact with light via optomechanics. Our experiment that I'm going to talk about today relies on this effect, so it falls under the second category. But before talking about the details of our experiment, let me give you a very brief summary of, of what has done, what has been done in this field up until now. So I have an incomplete list, which is still rather long on the right of, of the previous work. And on the left, I have listed some of the uh, key observations and summary of some of the key results uh, in this past work. Uh, looking at what has been achieved, we have a group of papers or works where uh, high efficiency trans, uh, transduction has been established. We can get actually efficiencies as close as 50%. But unfortunately, that comes with uh, a large number of added noise photons for each photon converted in your signal. Alternatively, you can, you can realize in a, a process where you have really low, no noise below one, but unfortunately that comes with a very small efficiency in 10 to minus 15 uh, regime. And to put these numbers in, in context, uh, when you think about the noise, you, if, if, you're, if your goal is to use a quantum transducer for remote entanglement generation, uh, you would you actually don't want noise because that reduces your fidelity. But depending on the details of the protocol you use, you can always uh, find a threshold for the noise uh, beyond which you, know, you lose entanglement uh, irreco irrecoverably. And uh, the details of how you calculate this threshold depends on how, what protocols you use but most thresholds are well below unity. So we really want to know if that should be well below one. Uh, efficiency is another important metric. It doesn't have a sharp threshold like noise, but at the end of the day, it factors in to the speed at which you can run your experiment. So if your efficiency is too low, ultimately you can't do much with it because it takes forever to, to pass on the information you are trying to pass. So having a system with low noise and high efficiency at the same time is, is, is still a missing thing uh, uh, when we look at this previous work. Another important point is that all these previous demonstrations have been with classical drives, both in the microwave domains where we have strong tones and in the optical domains where there has been you know, drives with laser fields. And so far there hasn't been uh, a demonstration with quantum signals coming directly from a superconducting qubit, mostly from the complexity of integrating a qubit uh, with these transducer system, both on the material side uh, or on fabrication, and also on, on 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 dealing with the problems and limitations that we face when trying to host the transducer inside the dilution refrigerator. So, with that very brief summary, uh, let's talk about our work. As I mentioned, I'm going to talk about quantum transduction via a mechanical mode. We have we got, we're going to have a qubit, a mechanical mode, and an optical cavity, and we are going to try to sequentially pass the information along this chain. So let me first talk about mechanics to optics coupling. Uh, this is called optomechanics. And uh, you know, conceptually, you can get this coupling if you add a moving part inside an optical cavity. For example, you can have an optical cavity with a mirror attached to an oscillator. And there, if you look at uh, the rate of change of the frequency, uh, the rate of change of the frequency of your optical cavity, as a function of mechanical displacement, uh, you can actually get an interaction term. This is written in terms of position here, but you can expand it in terms of creation and annihilation operators of a mechanical mode and convert it to this different form here, which describes the optomechanical uh, interaction Hamiltonian. This pre-factor here is called the optomechanical coupling rate, which really is the rate of interacting interaction with a single phonon and a single photon. And uh, this, Hamiltonian form here generally describes many many different phenomena in optomechanics and has been 
uh, exclusive and has been extensively uh, studied in the past few years. But we are not looking at the most general case here. We are actually we want we want a specific a very specific task that we want to realize. We want to pass a single phonon to a single photon and vice versa. And for this more specific case, you can actually further simplify the description of an optomechanical system. Here, you would need to consider the case of an optomechanical cavity that is driven with a laser field that is offset from the center frequency of the cavity. And the amount of this frequency offset or detuning is actually set to be equal to the mechanical frequency. In this case, you can take the optomechanical interaction Hamiltonian and further simplify it to this form here. This is actually called as the beam splitter interaction because it has this nice property that if you apply it for a finite duration of time on the system, it will actually realize a swap between the phonons and the photons. So all you need to pass a phonon to a photon or vice versa is to turn on your laser field at the right detuning for a finite duration of time. And, and at least conceptually, you can, you can get this, uh, this swap operation that, that we really want. There's of course, a lot of technical considerations for, for doing this with high efficiency. You need to think about the number of thermal excitations in your system. Uh, you need to think about the ratio of your optomechanical readout to the dissipation rates in the system. And uh, there's a few more detailed things, but luckily this has been carefully studied in the past few years and it's been realized in multiple different systems. So for, for the topic of discussion today, which is transduction, we can, we can assume that it's a, it's a simple task and we can do it. So this is actually the shape of the systems that we're going to use. Uh, the optomechanical systems we are going to consider are made from uh, silicon nanobeams, which are patterned to have an array of holes in them. These holes are actually uh, designed such that they form uh, phononic and photonic crystals, and they act as mirrors uh, re reflecting uh, acoustic waves and optical waves at the same time. So by playing with the shape and position of these mirrors along the beam, you can actually get a device where you can confine the optical field as well as the mechanical field at the center of the beam to a small volume of a few microns, and you can get a large uh, coupling between them. These devices were uh, devised and demonstrated uh, a couple of years back in Oscar's group, and since then there has been a few very interesting experiments with them on uh, detecting single phonons, on uh, distributing entanglement between two mechanical modes, and on making long-lived memories for, for optical photons, uh, for example. Uh, but the nice thing about this device is that it's, it's fairly simple. It's made from silicon, which is a good substrate uh, for making microwave circuits. And this has been you know, our motivation to relying on experiment on this well-established uh, uh, system. Can you say a little bit about the ZPF, the zero-point quantum fluctuations uh, uh, that you can achieve with these devices? Um, sort of, uh, yes. So. Uh, because ideally you'd want to make the ZPFs quite large, I guess, to have a large coupling, a large G, and so on. But uh, you know, there's some. Of course, yes. I mean, there is, of course, there is. There is a few. I mean, there's two contributing factors to getting a larger optomechanical coupling. There is the photoelastic effect, which is coming from the change in the refractive index of the dielectric from from having a strain inside it, and there is the moving boundary condition, which really maps to this more simple radiation pressure picture. Usually described to usually used to describe optomechanics, and both of these actually contribute in this design. Photoelastic effect is has a larger contribution, uh, and as you said, you, you generally want to have a small uh, effective mass to have a large displacement per phonon uh, to to get the maximum amount of coupling again per per photon and phonon. And uh, so here, the, these are actually they have you know the order of ten femtometer displacements, uh, if I'm quoting it correctly. The the value you can you can get this value by it's, it's actually a numerical optimization where you try to confine the mechanics and optics to the extent you can. Of course, if you do it too much, your optical quality factor drops, and and there's a few considerations like this. So you have to go through an optimization routine to to find a device where you can get a good optical quality factor, a good confinement both for both mechanics and optics. And silicon has a really large refractive index and a good photoelastic uh, effect coefficient which which gives you a large coupling rate you can get roughly about a megahertz of optomechanical coupling in, in these devices which has been one of the largest values you can get in, in any system as far as i'm aware 
Yeah. Uh, this is before the pump, sorry, or after? I missed that part. Before the? Uh, the one megahertz is, you mean the G? The, the one megahertz is the G for just the silicon of the mechanical crystal. Gotcha. Great. Yeah. Thank you. And this is for single photons. This is without a pump. When you have a pump, of course, you get it. You can parametrically enhance it. Yes. Exactly. This is yeah. a single photon coupling ring. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thanks uh, for the question. So now that we have talked about the coupling between optics uh, and mechanics, we can think about the other parts of this chain: the coupling between mechanics and a qubit. I am. Describing it here in terms of an LC resonator instead of a qubit, but we are talking about linear physics. So most of the concepts just map to a qubit as well. Uh, just like the optomechanical case, we can here uh, think about an LC resonator uh, with a moving part incorporated into it. This could be, for example, the plate of a, of a moving capacitor. And here, if you, if you actually bias this capacitor with a DC voltage and put some charge on it, we can get direct coupling between mechanical motion and the microwave field inside the resonator via the electrostatic uh, force coming from the charge in the capacitor. And that actually gives us, under the right condition, it gives us a Hamiltonian, which looks exactly the same as the optomechanical case. Uh, so conceptually, this is a way of realizing uh, an electromechanical coupling. But instead of this way, you can actually put a piezoelectric material uh, inside your capacitor. And if you have a slab of piezoelectric material there, you, you don't need to bias your capacitor anymore. You can, you can get the coupling from the material response of the slab, where you, when you put a strain and a mechanical displacement, uh, you, you automatically get an electrical dipole. But formally, you exactly get the same Hamiltonian at the end of the day, which is really what we need to, to realize a swap operation. And there has been, of course, a lot of work on trying to couple qubits uh, to mechanical modes. Uh, I am here showing uh, two of the designs uh, from recent demonstrations uh, from Stanford and Yale groups uh, where they're using aluminum nitride and lithium niobates as the piezoelectric material uh, used to form this coupling. There is a, it's actually a pretty challenging task to get uh, a decent coupling between mechanical modes and qubits because of a few challenges. First of all, we have to deal with a size mismatch problem. Uh, the wavelengths of, uh, of an acoustic wave at five gigahertz about a micron, which is much smaller than the typical size, the typical 100 micrometer size of a transmog qubit. So there's a size mismatch when we are trying to make this capacitor that you have to deal with. And the second problem comes from the fact that when you are introducing piezoelectric material into the fabrication process of your qubit, you usually have extra parts. The microwave loss tangents of all the ingredients may not be as good. So in practice, you end up losing uh, the coherence of your qubit in this process, uh, which is another concern uh, in, in making these experiments work well. But nevertheless, in spite of these challenges, these systems nowadays can work fairly well, and they can achieve a high efficiency swap operation between qubits and mechanical modes, which is good news for us, because that gives us the second ingredient of what we need. Uh, to make a quantum transducer. So talking about these two different optomechanic and piezoelectric parts, now we can at least conceptually think about a system where we have a mechanical, an extended mechanical mode with attached to microwave and optical parts inside a single device. And if we can make this, of course, we can, we can apply the logic I used earlier to, to make a transducer. But in order to do this, first of all, we need to we need to design this mechanical mode in such a way that is geometrically compatible with these very different systems. And the second thing we need to think about is the material platform we're going to use. Uh, we need to have access to piezoelectricity. We want a large optomechanical coupling effect. And we also want to make good qubits. And it's really hard to satisfy all these conditions into in the same system. The approach we have used for for tackling this problem is on uh, using aluminum nitride as a piezoelectric uh, and add it to our silicon uh, devices. As I said, optomechanical devices work well with silicon and silicon can be a good microwave substrate, certainly a good substrate for microwave circuits. So by adding aluminum nitride as a piezoelectric and by patterning it, uh, we can act, get access to piezoelectricity as well, which is our missing ingredient. 
This is the uh, a schematic of the material stack used in our work. We have uh, 300 nanometers of aluminum nitride on top of a silicon uh, uninsulated chip with a 220 nanometer silicon device layer. And our fabrication process really focuses on patterning this aluminum nitride layer and removing most of it so that we can isolate it only to the parts we care about. And then we are left with the silicon device layer, which we can pattern to make optomechanical devices. And at the end, we can add our, uh, we can evaporate aluminum to make qubits and superconducting uh, readout circuitry. And after that, we can actually remove our silicon dioxide, which will form a membrane, which we need because we have moving parts in the mechanical modes. And uh, that gives us our full device. We also have a, a, an additional uh, fabrication process where we remove some of our uh, handle silicon layer here to create room to bring an optical fiber near to our devices uh, to get access to them. So I'm not going to go through the details of all these steps, but I hope with this very little information, I can convince you that it's in fact possible uh, to, to bring together all these pieces in the same device uh, without making too many mistakes. And with that, I'm going to switch gears to talk about our design. So this is this is an overview of how the transducer element looks like. Uh, uh, it's actually, it has two parts. If you look at it, uh, we have a piezoelectric section where we have a slab of aluminum nitride on top of a patterned silicon membrane. And it's attached to an optomechanical crystal, which looks fairly the same as the one that I showed you so far. Here you can see the uh, displacement of the mechanical mode uh, from simulation. And on top of that, we have uh, the color coding, which shows the density of the mechanical energy. And as you see, we have an extended mechanical mode, which is extended and it lives in the entire device. Uh, it has a strong concentration in the piezoelectric part as we want. And it also has a large concentration in the optomechanical part where we also have a confined optical mode like, like before and the, and the overlap between these two gives us an optomechanical coupling. Uh, so this device is, in order, in, in terms of accessing this device, we have a optical waveguide on our chip, which is uh, evanescently coupled to this confined optical mode on the OMC cavity. And on the piezoelectric side, we actually have an interdigital uh, capacitor where the electrodes climb over this raised aluminum nitride platform. We can use these uh, electrodes to attach this device to a qubit. So um, maybe uh, just a, sure. a couple of questions of interest here in clarification. So um, so the, um, so part of the qubit capacitance is distributed over this interdigitated capacitor over this uh, phonon band gap medium. I'm guessing that's what the, the little square yes. Yes. Connected things are, um, and then on top of that, you have. Uh, how do they sit in the picture? It's a little hard to to understand how they. they work. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna first talk about the acoustic part. Then I'm gonna zoom out. Actually, I'll go to the qubit size uh, size scale. Then I'll go to the chip size scale, free size scale. So we are gonna talk about all of that. But but to, to answer part of your question, uh, as I said, this this size mismatch that I mentioned earlier translate to really the ratio of the capacitance in this uh, in this moving part to the total capacitance of the qubit. And it's it's very small in this case. We have uh, sub femtofarad, so, uh, you know, we have uh, about 60, I believe, femtofarads of capacitance for the qubit, and less than one femtofarad is, is coming from the transducer, which is very small. Oh, and yeah. I'll, I'll talk about some of the trade-offs that we had to we had to do in order to work in that regime. Very cool. OK, yeah, thank you. No worries. So to understand this acoustic part better, I'll talk about how we actually design it. We start with actually two entirely separate designs, uh, one piezoacoustic uh, resonator and one optomechanical transducer, as, and then we connect the two together. The optomechanics initial device is, 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 is fairly standard. It's, it's, it has a 5 gigahertz mechanical mode and a 200 terahertz optical mode with about a megahertz of optomechanical coupling between them as we have uh, talked about so far. The piezo acoustic part is actually, as I said, made from this aluminum nitride slab on top of the patterned silicon. Uh, this silicon base is attached to the surrounding uh, device layer using these pattern tethers, which are really uh, acoustic mirrors. These are 1D acoustic uh, band gap mirrors, 
uh, which are made such that we can confine the mechanical mode into this small region without having it radiate into the substrate. Here you can see the simulated uh, displacement uh, from the mechanical mode and the color coding shows the induced voltage in the piezoelectric uh, for, for this certain mechanical mode. And as you see, the periodicity in mechanical motion matches that of the electric field, which is really the property that allows us to selectively excite and address this single mode among the other existing modes in this system. As I just mentioned, uh, there's a few trade -off in, trade offs in, in designing this section. Uh, ideally, we want it to be as large as possible, really, because we want to have a large motional capacitance. We want to put as much of qubit capacitance on this part as possible. But if you make it too large, we're actually going to have many, many mechanical modes and a crowded mechanical spectrum, first of all, creates deviation from the single mode picture that I've used so far to, to, to describe everything. And more importantly, it creates a lot of dissipative channels for the qubit that creates uh, decoherence. So it's a, it's a trade-off here where we, are, where we try to keep our uh, spectrum uh, relatively clean, keep our uh, uh, free spectral range relatively large, while at the same time trying to make it as large as possible to increase the piezoelectric coupling. So that's part of the design. The second part, of course, is to, to match the lateral size of this slab to that of an OMC because we are going to attach the two together. So we start with two designs, as I said, we nominally make them to be resonant with each other. And then we have to come up with a way of connecting the two. As I mentioned, these holes in the, <clears throat> in the OMC are designed to have, uh, to act as a mechanical and, 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 and an optical mirror at the same time. But luckily by playing with the geometry of these holes, we can actually get to a regime where they act as, uh, they continue acting as an optical mirror, but they become transparent to mechanical waves. So here is one unit cell of the original cell, <clears throat> and here is the modified version. And for the modified version, if we simulate the mechanical band structure and the optical band structure, we'll find that we have a propagating mechanical mode at around five gigahertz, whereas near 200 terahertz, we still have an optical band gap. Mm -hmm. So by using this trick, we can actually go and modify half of our ONC structure such that optically it remains identical to the other hand side, but mechanically now it becomes transparent. It acts as like as a waveguide. And if we do this on half of the device, uh, we can actually use this mechanical waveguide section to connect the optomechanical crystal to the mechanical mode in the piezoelectric section. So here is the simulated mechanical mode where we have this extended mode going through the entire device. What happens here really is that we are connecting two nominally resonant mechanical modes via a mechanical waveguide in between, which forms a larger mechanical cavity. And I have to mention that because we want to preserve the optical shape of mode to the extent that's possible, we need to make this section uh, several micrometers long. Uh, you know, that's just set by the wavelengths of light. And that size consideration really makes an extended structure, which is multiple wavelengths long. So we have a multi-mode acoustic cavity living in this entire section. And when we look at the mechanical modes of these larger devices, uh, we automatically will get a case where our optomechanical uh, and piezoelectric couplings are now distributed among multiple modes in these structures. We don't have a single mode uh, anymore. So we are going to work with these uh, forms of a spectra. It, luckily, the spacing is, is large enough that we can still pick one of these and selectively address that and forget about the existence of the other ones for, for most of our experiment. So the single mode picture that I described so far is still valid, but of course we're paying a penalty in terms of having a reduced coupling rate uh, using uh, this strategy. And I have to say that it's not an entirely negative thing. Uh, maybe, the reason uh, we are working... Oh, sorry. I think uh, some questions sure, here before we move on too far. Yes, um, from Vadiraj. Hello, Vadiraj. Um, how about heat dissipation in the substrate coming from the voltage excitations? It's, it's a good question. Uh, there is heat dissipation both from optics and uh, electrical drive. As we will see, the real problem is really dissipation on the optic side, uh, mostly because you know photons have, are much more massive in terms of energy scale. The electrical side, given the good uh, loss tangent of these materials, uh, there is very little dissipation. There's actually work measuring the amount of heat you can get from electrical 
drives and with these sort of a structure that typically creates way less than one excitation both in the microwave and acoustic regime and so electrical is not a concern but optical is and i will talk more about yeah yeah scattering i guess also the pump or laser photons onto the substrate and so on into superconductors um the uh, prediction uh, agreement with uh, the actual measured experiment uh, values for say the band gap for you know all the dispersion curves and so forth how how uh, remind me how predictive the simulations are relative to the actual measured devices sure so when we don't measure the band structure directly we measure resonance frequency we measure up to mechanical coupling rates and such the resonance frequencies we we usually can get them if, if we can control our geometry so once we image the system and we know what we have made we usually can get the resonance frequencies as accurate as one part in a thousand. Uh, and uh, the coupling rates, they are within 10%, I would say, typically, uh, for the optomechanical coupling rate. The piezoelectric coupling, there is a little bit more uncertainty. That depends on the material quality. But as far as the geometry is concerned, which is these design ideas I'm describing so far, they are uh, they're extremely reliable and, and they are repeatable. Mm -hmm. We can actually verify this in the experiment. And it's a part per thousand on the optical frequency or uh, and also on the mechanical or just on the optical? Yeah, that's surprisingly so. Oh, well, that's uh, <laughs> good. Uh, optical, I mean, on the optical, it could be, I mean, it's for the optical, it, it is part per thousand on a good day. It's usually larger than that. Uh, right. It's probably in a part in part in hundred, uh, uh, which is more typical. Uh, on the mechanical side as well, you know, when we measure these devices at the room temperature, there's a frequency shift when we cool them down, and that adds to this uncertainty. But uh, ignoring ignoring that complication, if you just measure these at room temperature and you want to get your, your frequencies, if, if you are careful, you can you can get to you know sub percent level uh, mm. mechanical uh, frequency precision. Very I mean good. I'm going to talk actually about it in my next slide because as I said, we, we do pay a penalty in this and using this multi-mode structure, our couplings are, are smaller, they are distributed between multiple modes. But actually, because of these frequency disorders that we see in our devices, it, 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 is, it is a good thing to have a multi-mode device. Because if you had two parties exactly on resonance, you could, you could control the coupling between them, and you could, you could get a much cleaner spectrum, ideally with uh, you know, almost one or perhaps two modes. But here, we have a very strong mechanics mechanics coupling between our two parties which creates this multiple uh, mode uh, response but the nice thing about it is, is that the system is now fairly robust against frequency detuning between the two sections so these are simulation results for optomechanical and piezoelectric coupling rates when we sweep the detuning between two parts the optomechanical and piezoelectric in a 300 megahertz span and as you see in all these scenarios we we, we, we at least get one mode with substantial uh, piezoelectric and optomechanical coupling at the same time, which which has been one of the things we really needed to, to get the experiment to work. Uh, can you give me some intuition for what uh, changes as you go from one mode to the other? How are they, the modes, uh, just a bit more of a picture of what the different modes on the x-axis represent? Sure. sure. So if you had, if you, if you had a small, so as I said, ideally we want to think of this as one mode in the optical part, one mode in the piezo part, and some weak coupling between them. That would hybridize, hybridize the two. We would get a pair of modes on resonance with equal energy contribution there, and we would reduce. That would give us two modes when we would look at optomechanical coupling and two modes when we look at the piezoelectric coupling. And the coupling rates would drop by something like one over square root of two. Now, because we have these propagating modes in the section in between, we have more than two. We have you know four or five. And here, each of these modes has a certain energy distribution, a certain energy participation, I should say, in, in the optical part, and a certain energy participation in the piezo part, and that sets the amount of coupling you get for each. And it's, it's, it's a multi-mode cavity, and this is really a strong coupling between these two modes and the participating mode in between. So it's not easy to think of what happens in each and every scenario when you have detuning between these modes, but if you really, really detune these systems, you are going to end up recovering your two original modes, one piezoelectric, one of mechanics, no interaction between them. But when they are on resonance, you get something more similar to this case, where, where you get multiple modes, and each of them has some optomechanical and some piezoelectric coupling. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Great, thank you. 
So, so let's talk a little bit about the devices we actually made. This is the SEM image of a fabricated transducer. On the left, you see the uh, aluminum nitride section, and uh, there is this false coloring showing parts of the electrodes uh, that are climbing over this section. These electrodes get attached to a qubit, as you'll see shortly. And on the other side, we have our optical waveguide, which is evanescently coupled to our optical cavity here, which we use for optical drive and uh, readout of the system. Zooming out a little bit, this is, uh, this is the full suit of our devices on the chip. We have a trans one qubit made from a pair of Josephson junctions and you know, the large capacitive part of the qubit. We have a pair of narrow electrodes extending from the capacitor in the transmon and attaching it to the transducer, which is this tiny section here, zoomed out into this inset. I, I hope this really shows this size challenge that I talked about. Uh, as you can see, the transducer is much smaller than the transmon. And uh, these electrodes actually get connected to the electrodes on the piezoacoustic resonator. Here you see the transducer, the, the optical waveguide extending out of it actually comes to the edge of the chip where we can access it uh, using a lens fiber to focus uh, light onto this waveguide. On the other side of the chip, we have a microwave resonator. It's a lumped, uh, lumped element resonator, uh, dispersively coupled to the qubit. And in addition, we also have a microwave coplanar waveguide. It's, it's an unusual one, but it's a coplanar waveguide, believe me, that we use to uh, read out the disper that, that we use to read out to read out the uh, resonator here. And it also has some direct coupling to the qubit, which we are going to use, as I'll explain uh, in our experiment section. Um, and so, uh, sorry, the microwave waveguide here is supposed to to couple direct mostly to the qubit and the read can you say more it's about primarily it primarily yeah. coupled to the it's primarily coupled to the readout resonator but it has a small coupling rate also to the qubit directly uh -huh. i see okay mm. yes mm. yes and and we, we are going to need this direct coupling as, as we'll see uh, it, it's and, uh, could you say uh, more about the shielding of the superconductor from stray light we're going to get into that. Uh, this is a huge part of problems in our, in our experiment, as I, will talk to about, uh, as I will talk about it. But right now, actually, we don't have much shielding. This is the chip. The chip, uh, I'm going to take a look at the zoom out of the chip, but the optical fiber gets close to it, and we couple light uh, to the waveguide here. We get about between 65 to 68% uh, coupling efficiency from the light mm. in the fiber to That's the good. waveguide. The rest of it, the rest of it, just propagates directly to towards the circuit, and it does affect it in a in a negative way, as we will see. So there isn't much optical shielding beyond this. I wish we had more. We had done some work, as you see, this uh, long optical waveguide is is part of our, our our attempt to laterally create some displacement between the qubit and optical fiber. It, it's because of our previous experiment where we saw that the stray light directly coming from the fiber hits the qubit and by making this lateral displacement, we could actually reduce the effect quite a bit, but it's, uh, but it's not uh, as effective in eliminating the effect at all as we will see. And uh, why is that wire uh, uh, wiggling? <laughs> Which one, this one? Uh, the, uh, the one oh, that goes one. to the optical fiber. The, uh, the, the one that, the optical, oh, this the, guy, I see. Yeah. Oh, this, is the, this is the optical waveguard, oh, okay. Well, this is a released structure, uh, and this, this optical waveguide, you see a zoom-in section here, as the waveguide propagates, uh, if it keeps on going uh, because of the stress in the film when we release this uh, membrane, we actually get this waveguide getting bent, and it could actually bend out of plane or down towards the, stuff, uh, towards the handle where it could touch the, pre the, the lower level. And so to avoid that bending, we actually need to add a few tethers holding these waveguides, but when we do that, that creates a lot of, uh, it, that creates some absorption and scattering of light. So there's a penalty in doing that. So we have a few tethers. And the other thing we do is we create this wiggle, which helps us in releasing the stress uh, once, the, once the devices are released. And that uh, helps with keeping the waveguide in play uh, where it's uh, supposed to be. 
Oh, I see. Yeah, because my other question was going to be, why not just take that waveguide all the way to as far as you can on the chip? Because I'm guessing the chip is larger than this piece. I mean, here. there is no conceptual problem. There's no conceptual issue in doing that. This is, again, a release. It's a huge release structure. It's actually the whole release part is about a millimeter by a millimeter, which which makes it really unstable if you're pushing this, this geometry uh, in doing this. Uh, and uh, that creates some problem. You are, you are sectioning big parts of the membranes by cutting this waveguard through them, and eventually they're going to tear apart if there is uh, some static strain in, in the membrane uh, once it's released. So mm -hmm. it's, there's conceptually you can do it. Practically, you probably still can do it, but you know, given other priorities we had on this version of this experiment, this was the most we could do. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. So this is the zoom out of the chip. We have an array of eight devices with different, slightly different parameters. On the left side, we have a pocket where we remove uh, our silicon, part of our silicon uh, handle layer to have optical access to the qubit. On the other side, we have the coplanar waveguide coming to the edge of chip where we wire bond them uh, to a circuit uh, board. I have to say that this is not the device we measured. That one actually looked quite a bit better, but I kept this image because some of these uh, defects you see are representative of the trauma that these devices go through when we, when we make them. So it shows that there's a lot of room for improvement. And, and I think it's important to, to stress that. And uh, what happened on uh, the very right uh, corner of the device? It looks, <laughs> it looks pretty interesting. <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah, yes. It's, it's, so as I said, we, we make the full device, and then the final step is, is, is on the, doing this deep edge to make optical access where we have to do photolithography, and we use a very thick resist layer to cover this part where we etch the rest of the chip here. And here, in this case, there was some cracks in that photoresist, which, which you know, could not protect the aluminum layer underneath. The aluminum actually got etched in part of the chemical processing, and that, that's why you see these islands of... Of of, uh, of aluminum. Again, this was this was not measured. This was a failed chip, uh, but but many of these issues uh, happened also to the chip that happened, but not this one, like the mm, Thank you. Zooming out a bit more, this is how we do our measurements. The chip sits in a device holder uh, next to a three D nano positioner, where we couple light uh, by controlling the position of the fiber. Uh, with respect to the device. This assembly is right here under a microscope where we can look at it and do our room temperature calibrations. Uh, we also have another piece that sits on top of our uh, qubit chip and it hosts a coil, which we use for our flux tuning uh, the transmon qubit. Uh, the assembly sits inside the dilution refrigerator. At the mixing stage, we have RF cables to Read the microwave side, we have a DC line to flux tune the qubit, and we have an optical fiber uh, to, to look at the optical light coming out of the transducer. We also have a single photon detector in the same fridge, and we actually take light out of the device to the room temperature, process it, and then move it back to the same fridge for doing single photon detection. So I will move a little bit faster because uh, to make sure we are on time. So now I'll quickly go through the sets of experiments we do once we cool down a device. The first thing we do is we do a, we, we, we couple light to the device, we sweep the frequency of the laser, and we identify our optical cavity. If it's at the right place, if it has an OK quality factor, that tells us we are looking at the right thing. And once we do that, we can actually try to use optomechanics to identify our mechanical modes. I mentioned this beam splitter interaction, and that would actually allow us to park our laser uh, on the red sideband of the cavity. And look, by looking at the reflected light, you can actually get mechanical motion in your mechanical oscillator of converted to photons, as we talked about. So we can actually do this experiment in CW, in continuous wave, to look at uh, the off converted thermal Brownian motion of the device. And using doing that, you can identify your mechanical modes. The, the center of these peaks shows where the mechanical resonance frequencies are and the area under them is proportional to the optomechanical coupling. So you can make a table like this, you can extract mechanical modes and the optomechanical coupling rates by doing just a simple calibration here once the device is cold. A uh, quick question from the folks here. Um, sure. I, you know, how do you align the lens fiber to the chip in the fridge? Uh, I guess we talked about the piezo stages. 
with, with, with a lot of difficulty, is, is the answer. <laughs> so what we do, it, it's, it's happening in the dark. We don't see it. So we have to, we have to couple them at room temperature. Then we, we have a protocol. Then we move them back to make sure they don't hit the device once things are colder and there's relative displacement. And then once we turn on the laser, we can look at the reflection coming back from the fiber. And looking at the reflection, there's ways of knowing where you are with respect to the edge of the chair. And then you gradually have to go back to the previous uh, position where you had coupling. It, it's a complicated protocol, but it just requires patience, and then you can do it. Mm. And I guess each time yeah. you move the piezo, the fridge heats up a little bit, and you have to wait, you know, 20 minutes or something. Is that usually uh, for for doing this? Uh, you can, I mean, depend on how fast you want to do it, but you can do it at you know, slightly raised temperatures of, you know, uh, a few hundred millikelvin. You can, your qubit won't work, but the fridge doesn't warm up in the sense that mm -hmm. you have to, mm -hmm. you know, recondense your mixture or things like that. Okay. So it maybe takes a, a day, maybe two days or something to align. <laughs> well, it depends on how cavalier you want to be, because if you make a mistake and you go too far, you hit the membrane and then the whole device shatters. And uh, <laughs> that is really the hard part, not, not the clicks. Uh, but you know one or two days is, is is typical for the first time and then after that you can do it probably in an hour all right awesome thank you uh okay so once we identify our mechanical modes with the mechanical characterization we can actually do an electrical characterization using the qubit i mentioned our waveguide has some direct coupling to the qubit so that allows us to look at the reflection from the waveguide just send a microwave tone and see the qubit reflection and because we have flux tuning, we can tune our mechanical, our, our, our qubit frequency ac across the spectrum where we see the mechanics is. And each time the qubit passes through a mechanical resonance, we see the signature in reflection. And I'm putting this data here next to our optomechanical characterization. As we see, luckily these modes line up, which is good news. It tells us that our understanding of the device is correct. And if you have enough coupling, you actually get these avoided uh, mode crossing where you can extract your piezoelectric coupling between your qubit and the mechanical modes. So once we do this, we make another table from electrical measurements and put it next to the optical table, and then we can identify one mode with good optomechanical and piezoelectric coupling, which in this case is this guy here. And from now on, we'll just assume that it's just the only mode we have in the system, and we'll use it as our coherent channel for transduction. So I have to move on fast. Uh, yeah. The next step of the experiment is that's okay. You can, you can, you don't have to go too okay, crazy. Okay, sure. sure. Any, <laughs> any questions? Uh, any questions I, so far? Um, oh, I think right now we're okay, but uh, we don't have to end okay, on the. Great. It's okay. You can, you can go a little longer. <laughs> great. That sounds good. So, once we identify our mechanical modes, we have a mechanical mode. We see it on the optical side. We see it on the microwave side. So far, we only did CW measurement uh, and spectroscopy to to find where things are. The next step is to do some time domain control. The, the, pro, the, the, the protocol I talked about is, is, is sequential. We want to go from the one free quantum state in the qubit, map it to the phonons, and then we want to read out the phonons to, to photons. The first step is just preparing the qubit. So what we do is we detune the qubit a little bit away from our mechanical mode of interest there. We can treat it as an isolated qubit. Uh, we can excite it, and we have a dispersive uh, readout using the, uh, using the resonator on the chip. So we can do the standard uh, experiments on the qubit. We, here you can see uh, the Rabi oscillation when the qubit is driven. Uh, doing that, we can calibrate our pi pulses and pi over two pulses and such. And then we can do free decay and Ramsey experiment to extract T1 and T2 star and uh, similar parameters for the qubit. And this thing is numbers here. We have a T1 of 500 nanosecond and a T2 star of about mm -hmm. 700 nanosecond, which are pretty short even what we can do on silicon and even on SOI. Uh, but it's perhaps not surprising given all we have done, you know, in these many, many layers of fabrication on these chips. And uh, luckily, if these are large enough to still to allow us to <laughs> Sorry, what's that? I was saying it's longer than the first T1 and T2 I ever measured. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I guess. My, my you know, it's great. Generations. We are spoiled. My first qubit was 15 microseconds. So, uh, uh, so, like so it's a little bit of a disappointment, but the fact that it is still works is great. You know, it, it means we can do things with it. We can coherently drive. So once we do that, we can now think about the transduction sequence. 
The next step would be to do a swap operation between the qubit and the acoustic mode. And for that, we need to turn on and off our interaction uh, dynamically. And we can't do that, but we can tune our effective detuning between the acoustic part and the qubit. For that, we could use our flux tuning, but it's pretty slow, so it wouldn't allow us to do any dynamic control. So instead, we use AC Stark shift via the waveguide. Here, we just send a tone down in the waveguide. It gets reflected back, and uh, if this tone is detuned from the qubit, we can get an AC Stark shift. It's very much the same as the cavity case. The, the math is a bit different, and we have also a dispersive readout cavity nearby, so we have to be careful where we choose these. Uh, tone such that we don't excite the mode in, inside the inside the resonator, but you know, ignoring this technical part, it actually works pretty well. Here is the calibration of moving to the frequency of two qubits via a uh, constant drive in, in on the waveguide, and uh, we can actually use this calibration to form pulses where we can get uh, shifts as large as 10 megahertz in in, in relatively short 15 nanoseconds uh, times. So that gives us this probe uh, to realize a swap between the qubit and the mechanics. Having this probe, we can now prepare the qubit in the excited state, drive it on to resonance with the mechanical mode, and come back and read the number of excitation left in the qubit. And we can repeat this experiment by sweeping the interaction time between the qubit and the mechanics. And if we do that, this is what we find. This is the vacuum Rabi oscillations we are seeing between the qubit and uh, the mechanical resonator. And from this oscillations, we can actually extract the piezoelectric coupling rate, which we do, and we find it to be in agreement with our spectroscopy data earlier, which is good. But we can also calibrate the efficiency of performing a swap. And a swap here corresponds to this point in time where we can map one excitation in the qubit to a phonon uh, into the acoustic cavity. And by doing a fit on this curve, we actually extract the efficiency of that swap operation to be about 75%, which is, which is pretty good, as we will see compared to other efficiencies in our system. Uh, we can also use this swap operation to prepare, to initiate a phonon in the, in the mechanical mode and also to read it back. So we can, we can use that to measure the lifetime of the mechanics, which we find, and we find it to be 357 nanoseconds. To, to provide some more context, the line which we get for the mechanical mode for the mechanical mode from our optical measurements is about a megahertz. So, all in all, our co the, our, our coherence time and our lifetime for the mechanics are somewhat similar to that of the qubit, and similar to the qubit, they are way shorter than what you expect for you know pure silicon devices uh, in, in in this geometry. They are even actually shorter than what you can get from best aluminum nitride uh, devices. I can I can talk afterwards about <clears throat> what could be the causes of this, but uh, these are a, these were a bit surprising to be this short. But again, they seem to be good enough to allow us to do this swap operation, which is all we need at this point. So this takes care of the first part of the sequence. The second part of the sequence is optomechanical mechanical readout. I talked about it a lot so far. So we just come in with a laser excited system, and we do the readout. I have to say that on the reflection, once we get the signal, we have to filter out our reflected drive tone, uh, the pump laser, which requires an optical filter uh, before our single photon detector to just block the reflected light. Uh, and then we can, we can get our scattered photon onto the single photon detector. This is a more detailed, the schematic of the setup. We have the field fridge at the center with the optical parts and microwave uh, instrumentation uh, pieces around it. Everything is controlled with the master uh, pulse generator, which controls the timing between the different parts of the sequence. Uh, I have there's a few technical points I'm mentioning here. Perhaps the most difficult part here is in <clears throat> is in having uh, enough extinction from our optical filter. I just mentioned why we have these optical filters. Uh, to get enough extinction from them, we actually need above 100 dB of extinction which unfortunately translate to a low transmission efficiency. So these filter banks here that we have is made from three filters, uh, gives us 120 dB of extinction, but that comes with only 1% efficiency, which is a, is a, is a big part of the, the, big part of the you know, loss in our system. There's also a few other things about how you make your pulses to have enough contrast and on the timing of them. Uh, but all in all, this is again, well-established experimental techniques that one can do. So, I'll, I'll leave it at there unless there is a question. So 
we have the swap between qubit and mechanics, we can do the optomechanical part. So let's do the full experiment. Here, we start with the qubit. We excite it to the excited state here, the blue case, and do optomechanical readout. You don't get the photon outside of the system because of these inefficiencies I mentioned, but sometimes you get them. So if you repeat this experiment over and over, you can, you can calculate a rate or a probability of detection for the photon. We can then repeat this experiment without driving the qubit, which would live within the ground state or almost in the ground state. And uh, we can do the rest of the sequence like before, and then we can get a new rate. And comparing these two rates, first of all, we see that we see a statistically meaningful separation between the two, which is good news. It's indicative that we're perhaps seeing light being converted from one excitation. Uh, here, this the difference between these two levels would correspond to the level of uh, signal we are getting for one microwave excitation in the qubit. And this residual number of photons we are getting for the ground state maps to our source of noise. So we can calibrate how much noise we have and how much efficiency. So we get about 10 to minus 5 if total efficiency for the conversion from a qubit to the optical photon and an added noise of about half a, half a photon. So this is all indicative, it's, it's great news. Seems like the experiment is working. We also did some more check where we extract numbers from independent piezoelectric and optomechanical experiment and put them together to estimate these efficiencies and noises. And, and we get these numbers here, which are not exactly the same, but within error bars, they agree with, with, with what we measure <clears throat> during the full measurement sequence, which, which is good news. It tells us that we are probably looking at the right thing. So this is, this is a major part of, of our results here. Um, we have done another experiment as a further check where instead of just exciting the qubit or, or leaving it in the ground state, we continually drive it with a microwave resonant pulse, which we with, with a very, uh, can sorry. you, can you uh, sure. explain to us what uh, 0.57 ADA add means in, in terms of um, sort of more intuitive picture? So if we don't have any excitation in the qubit, and we run the we run the trans we run the uh, transducer sequence. Uh, if if we don't have any inefficiency, if we had efficiency of one, we would get 0.57 photons in the output because uh -huh. of the noise sources. Uh -huh. So it's the it's the noise we see in the output referred to input in equivalent of the you know, number of excitation in the qubit. So that is what this number means. Okay. And this is the numbers I was talking about all along saying that we want to keep it below one. Yeah, yeah. Right, I guess if it's one or above, you're sort of swamping your other one photon completely. Exactly, which is, which is the level of your signal. So, I mean, that's an SNR of one roughly maps to an added noise of one. Right. So to get any meaningful information out of the system, you would need an added noise below one. And yeah. I mentioned these previous results with you know 50% efficiency, but you had 30 added noise photons, which, which is a big number. Or you could get around 0.5 or 0.3, but then you had 10 to minus 15 efficiency. So really the summary of the result is getting these two numbers together, mm. this amount of noise with this amount of efficiency. And I'll talk more about it. This is actually important what sets. There is a trade-off between the two, which is pretty important. And I'll just talk about it. But but before that, let me let me okay. talk about this last piece of data, <clears throat> which is uh, which is showing the rate of detecting photons as a function of the length of time we are driving our qubit with the microwave resonant pulse. Uh, and doing this experiment, we are going from zero to three pi uh, in Rabi drive uh, strengths. Uh, and we can see that we are seeing the oscillating counts coming out, which looks like the Rabi oscillation of the qubit, as we expect. This shaded region is actually a fit. It's a 90% interval fit. But the frequency of this fit function is actually not a free parameter. It is set to the frequency of Rabi oscillations we get from a pure electrical measurement where we use the qubit dispersive readout to read it out. And as you see, the frequency just matches exact, almost exactly within the data quality uh, to what we get from the optical output. So this is, this is fairly strong evidence that we are looking at the light from the qubit. And again, to get heuristic uh, metrics on how well the system is working or how bad it is, you know, that this contrast what you have here to this baseline it talks about signal to noise and the magnitude of these numbers on the y scale tells about the efficiency of the system. 
So I'll, the rest of, I have a few more slides. I'll talk about the limitations in the experiment and where they can be improved uh, and what why, they mean. Does, um, uh, can you explain uh, where the bottleneck in time is in terms of the two weeks? Yes, so that's that's the topic of the next few slides. <laughs> this data takes about two weeks to get, uh, which which is still amazing that it works. Uh, you know, yeah, given given that what we could do before, but it, it's very long nevertheless, and that limits us in terms of what we can do with the transducer. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why it's two weeks. So the first bottleneck comes from efficiency. The total efficiency is ten to minus five, as I mentioned, which is rather low. It's 10 order of magnitude larger than the previous experiment with the same level of noise. So it's a huge improvement over everything that has existed so far, but this is still a very small absolute number. Uh, if you break down this efficiency, we can actually get you know, a factor of 1% from our measurement setup, as I mentioned. So this is purely technical and uh, it's actually easy to fix as I will talk about more this later on. The, but the we have this factor. Of, again, you said? This uh, is the, op the optical filter. This is the optical filter. Oh, exactly. It's 1.5%. Right. So we have the 10 to minus 3, which is really the internal efficiency on the chip for the transducer. And the, the reason we have this small number is that we are using a very small, a very short 40 nanosecond uh, pulse to, to read out the mechanical mode. And for the level of optomechanical couplings we have, that short pulse is not sufficient to fully read out the, the acoustic mode, to, to fully do the swap on the output. So we have a low efficiency readout on one part in 1,000. So we can, of course, increase this efficiency by changing the duration of this readout pulse. But what happens is that we have optical absorption heating of the mechanical mode. It's a well understood parasitic effect that unfortunately happens in these optomechanical systems. So if you try to go to do this experiment, here you can see the results. We are changing the, on the x axis, we are changing the pulse duration for the readout. On the y axis, we are looking at the counts that come out. You would see that if you use a longer pulse, you'll get a higher efficiency. Which is, <clears throat> which is this blue curve here, but at the same time, we have a larger noise. So if you are trying to stay below one, this is about the best we could do, which, which is where the 10 to minus three number comes from. So there's an inherent trade-off in this system between the amount of noise you can get and the amount of efficiency because of the optical absorption heating. Any, any question at this stage? Um, yeah, I guess um, maybe can you say a little bit more about the absorption and, and what the leading source yes, of that? Yes, uh, yes, of course. The absorption seemed to come from uh, the, the heating, I, I should say, seemed to come from optical absorption. So we have this pump photon. When we turn it on, uh, some of the photons get absorbed and eventually they, they find their ways into uh, creating mechanical excitations, which heat up the mechanical mode. Uh, and that contributes to this noise here. Where that absorption comes from is rather old research showing that uh, most of, in, in a good silicon cavity, most of the absorption comes from surface defects, uh, uh, which are, you know, sub gap uh, emitters uh, inside silicon. And uh, there is actually some very interesting recent work on uh, using surface passivation techniques to reduce them. I'll talk a little bit more at the end about these. Uh, but basically, phenomenologically, what you see is a heating uh, that is that there's a lag, it happens after you hit the pulse. It's rather slow and then it, it scales with your optical power, but but not so strongly such that, you know, you, you basically, uh, you can you can benefit a little bit if you use more power because your optomechanical coupling rate increases, the heating doesn't increase as fast, but there are limited things we can you can do about them beyond uh, thinking about fixing how to reduce the heating at the device level, which I'll talk more about later. Mm -hmm. and, and these are optical defects that absorb at, uh, at, at optical, optical frequency defects, yes, the yes. optical cavity. Yes, yes, yes. And what about the yes, uh, yes. scattered or thermal photon, uh, scattered light or, or evanescent light that leaks out of the waveguide well, onto superconductor? Scattered light, that's our next slide. That's so in terms of efficiency and heating, uh, oh, you're talking about heating caused by the scattered light. Is that what you're talking? Um, well, really, at uh, you can have heating by scattered light, but you know that is very weak because we have this buildup of energy on resonance on the optical mode, which is right next to the mechanical mode. Scattering is is more, much more broad spatially in all directions and doesn't have this resonance enhancement. So you, it's very improbable to get heating uh, from a scattered light. But what a scattered light does is, uh, you know, it it hits the superconducting circuit. 
And we see that once we do a readout, our qubit really disappears. We can't do any coherent operation on the qubit. Uh, and the qubit is just lost for an extended period of time. It takes about 10 milliseconds to recover the qubit after shining light on it. And that's why we can only run our experiment at that only 100 hertz, which is a small rate. Uh, we, and this recovery time actually is not a strong function of the optical power. Uh, it, it, it just happens almost immediately after hitting the, uh, the, the qubit and it, there's this long recovery time, as I mentioned. We think it's from uh, quasi-particle generation in the superconductor, which is not surprising. You know, people make optical photodetectors using this, yeah, uh, this effect. Uh, and, and, and aluminum is, has a long quasi-particle lifetime, which is not good uh, if you care about this effect unless you want to make a detector. Uh, so what, what we have done here is that we have actually measured the quasi-particle lifetime in our sample using pure electrical measurement. We just electrically excite them. We look at the qubit coherence deteriorating after that, and we map the dynamics in time. And uh, we can we can actually you can see the result here. Uh, this blue curve we can measure the quasi we can we can measure a signal that lets us find the quasi particle lifetime with. And uh, in trying to alleviate this problem, we have actually used a cooling magnetic field uh, uh, when when we condensing uh, our mixture uh, to to pin vortices inside our qubit, and the vortices actually can trap the quasi particles so by creating more vortices we can somewhat uh, accelerate the recombination of these quasi particles which reduces the effective quasi particle lifetime we have measured this lifetime electrically without this vortex trapping and with vortex trapping we see a factor of five enhancement in, in shortening the quasi particle lifetime and then we, when we do the optical measurement we see a corresponding factor of five in in the in the speed of, of the experiment so that tells us that uh, probably most of this effect is coming uh, from the quasi-particles. Right. Uh, and do you actively, so uh, thank you, Vadirash, for the question. Do you actively cool the mechanical mode to its ground state using sideband cooling techniques, or is it high frequency enough that you don't need to? Care? No, this is at 5 gigahertz, so it's already there. Uh, the, the residual mechanical, if you go back to this curve, when you start reading out the mechanics at early times, uh, the number of excitation, I think that the lowest we can find is, is, is a few percent, you know, it's, it's below point it's one, uh, the, the number of excitation initially in the mechanics, yes. So do you have to do something special to really thermally uh, anchor well the, the, the substrate uh, to make sure that's thermalized well or and doesn't, you know, take two, three weeks to actually cool down to base temperature? There is there is a few things that uh, indicate we should do that right now with this experiment uh, we didn't uh, we didn't do much but uh, we had we actually had a uh, temperature sensor near our device which showed that we have an elevated uh, temperature near our substrate when even though we are using very short pulses and very low duty cycles so even in the steady state we see some heating of the substrate uh, you know tens of millikelvin nothing too drastic but it is still measurable. Uh, so we don't do much in terms of uh, anchoring the device beyond what we do for, for superconducting qubits here. But there are ideas that you can think about in, in, in making this, uh, you know, this anchoring better, and that can actually contribute to making better devices. So here I've actually listed all these numbers we have so far. So right now we can run the experiment at 100 hertz efficiency of E1, E minus 5, and half a noise roughly. And if you think about where we can make things better, well, for the first thing, the first thing perhaps we could do is to use something other than aluminum, something with a shorter quasi-particle lifetime, like niobium, where we can make the experiment repetition line, repetition time a much rate much faster, and we can get actually to a regime that we won't be limited by quasi-particle lifetime. We would be limited by the time it takes to cool down the mechanics between two readouts. And that should get us to about 20 kilohertz from this 100 hertz. As I mentioned, our optical filters have this 1% efficiency. This is a problem of money. If you buy more expensive uh, filters, you can get to about 40% uh, easily. <clears throat> so, so that is a problem that can be solved. And then the last problem is this issue of internal low efficiency, which is tied to this issue of having noise. And there, as you mentioned, one thing we can do is better is to provide better thermal contact. And one of the ideas that was uh, explored around uh, 
towards this uh, is, is actually discussed in this paper by, by Jared Ren, uh, is on making a 2D optomechanical crystal where you can get a 2D confinement of the mechanical modes and the, optic, and the optical mode. But because you have some connectivity along this orthogonal direction, you have a, you have a larger uh, thermal conductivity. In this case, this theoretically, uh, it was expected to get a 30 times larger contact surface area, which should give us you know, a factor of 10 reduction in, uh, in the steady state number of uh, thermal phonons for a given level of optical drive. And this paper actually has also some experimental uh, measurement that shows that it can actually work. So, so this is an idea that is worth pursuing, but there's other things you can do to have better thermal contact for sure. And then the other thing you can do is to reduce the sources of these heating, which is, as I mentioned, we think most of them happen at the surface, this optical absorption. And there is uh, existing work showing that, uh, you know, using better surface, pass surface passivation can, can in fact uh, reduce the amount of heating. So, so these are all uh, things you can improve. I put here numbers that we can cautiously, but optimistically expect if we do all these things, you know, 20 kilohertz rate, 40% external efficiency, 10% internal, and then noise level of 0.1. So this is what we can expect to get from a transducer if, if you do these things. And you can do probably things to go beyond this, but th these are immediately things you can imagine. And I just want to say a few words about what you can do with these numbers. The, perhaps the first thing you would want to do is to look at the single photon nature of the light that comes out of this device. So far, I mean, we, we should have been able to do this with our current device, but the measurement time is just too long and it's prohibitive to do it. But if you have these numbers that I showed you based on these assumptions of where you can improve the device, you can expect to measure the second order correlation function uh, for the device to do an anti-bunching experiment in a matter of about an hour or so, uh, where you can see hopefully conclusive evidence uh, for non-classical radiation coming out of the device, uh, showing that we have actually single photon. And then you can think about more slightly more complicated things like remote entanglement generation, where you can, for example, get two transducers and uh, combine the light from them in a beam splitter to erase which path information and you know herald a, a Bell state uh, with detection of a photon. If you estimate how fast you can do it, you get to about 50 hertz with these improved numbers, which which is not a large number, but I have to say that it's actually comparable to the earliest results with. Uh, parametric down conversion in nonlinear crystals. So, so it's not too bad. Uh, I think this is, this is fairly exciting uh, to think about uh, these next steps. And, and of course, there's multiplexing techniques that you can do to go beyond this number. And there's more, uh, there's more ideas on you know, what protocols you can use uh, to, 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 to make the best use of a, an imperfect transducer, which, has, which are worth pursuing. So with that, I finished my talk. I hope this. I have to emphasize this is an early result. We have, we are barely seeing the signatures of uh, light transduction from a qubit, but I hope it has been sufficient to, 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 provoke, to make a case for how exciting this line of research is. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mohammed. This was amazing. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's incredibly difficult and, and very impressive results. Uh, the first question we had from the audience, which I think you're you. kind of getting at, is exactly, you know, how do we know the output of the photon is a quantum signal as opposed to a classical signal that is correlated to a projection mm -hmm. of the state? Mm -hmm. uh, I think you've touched on yes. that. Yes. To expand. Yeah, I can say a few more words. So this anti bunching experiment, this is perhaps one of the first places people saw real signatures of quantum optics uh, historically. If, if you find a single photon on a beam splitter, it could go either on, out from one port or the other. So if you look at the coincidence between two single photon detectors and the output of a beam splitter, uh, you can't get both the photon appearing at both places at the same time. So the rate of coincidence when, when properly normalized to the rate of single photons, uh, which, would, which is called the second order co uh, coherence or second order correlation function actually drops to zero or, or below a certain threshold uh, below one. Which, which is a uh, known signature of non-classical radiation. So that's one experiment that you can do. And it's done with quantum dots, you know, and these centers are optically active qubits uh, all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sort of Hanbury-Brown type of twist. Uh, and- uh, Yes, it's like Hanbury-Brown twist on a non-classical source. Yeah, 
yeah yeah i guess that was the real difficulty in those initial experiments right? the experiment's not so hard in the sense if you can produce single photons but if you can then it's really difficult and that was the challenge back exactly. then exactly. um so uh, uh let's see here from uh, from yami uh which uh eda tools did you use Call in God. your design i guess this is a more technical question <laughs> Okay, I mean, there's many aspects of our design. If, if if you can specify, you know, which which part of the design I might be able to um, make it more useful. Maybe concept. let's start with the superconducting and then I guess the uh, mechanics, I suppose. Uh, for okay, the okay, the, the, just general uh, way of simulating, and I'm yeah, maybe if you want to use that, box. <laughs> okay, okay. So our, I mean our qubits and electromagnetic parts were simulated with sonnet and console these are standard uh, software packages for yeah. looking at uh, linear linear response of microwave circuits uh, the junction we usually model as a nonlinear inductor uh, up to mechanical uh, simulations they are partly done in, in console as well uh, and, and so is the uh, piezoelectric so I would say a combination of console and sonnet uh, was you know, what we needed to do all of them, almost everything here. Wonderful. And um, I think uh, seeing no further questions and having, oh, uh, we have a clarification from Yami, the transducer part, uh, if that helps. <laughs> yes, the transducer part is, is, is almost entirely done in console. Entirely done in console, great. Uh, and uh, from Badi Raj, thank you for all the questions, Badi Raj. Uh, any interesting applications of using squeeze mechanical states together with the qubit coherence properties? I guess it's a more open-ended question. Yeah, it's an interesting line of thought. I guess more broadly, the question, if I if I understand it correctly, is referring to probably the sort of non-classical states of mechanical mode that you can get from optomechanics uh like squeeze the states and then combining them with what you can get from a qubit it's it's an interesting line of thought uh from a physics point of view from a more engineering point of view if you have a josephson junction with this incredible nonlinearity and control over quantum state why should you worry about getting weak nonlinearities from optical mechanics so <laughs> yeah that, that's my answer I'm, but, but there might be interesting things i i, I don't know great all right well seeing as we're about uh half an hour over uh unless there are any final pressing questions from uh, the audience i'd like to uh, uh thank you mohammed for uh, accepting the invitation for taking the time today i'd also like to very much appreciate uh you the audience uh, for tuning in uh today and regularly and staying with us for uh this uh, beautiful uh, work and uh in-depth seminar with all the questions uh, so with that, I'd like to um, uh, thank you, Mohammed. thank the audience, invite you to uh, come next Friday again to our next seminar uh, every Friday at noon. Stay tuned, follow the channel. Uh, so thank you, Mohammed, and uh, I think we'll keep the post, the recording up. I'll, of course, leave, any, uh, leave you to say any final words or uh, thoughts you would like to share with us. Yeah, Such thank you. Thank you so much. This has been great. Uh, and I think I, I think you said you are looking for uh, folks, so uh, people like Yeah, this that project. would be great. I mean, feel free to contact me if you have questions or you're interested to learn more about future right. or current work. I'd be happy to talk to you. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you very much again, and uh, we'll see you next week, everyone. Have a great weekend.